The drop. Love me deeply, Frankie, move with passion and intensity. He can't fulfill you like this, can he? Absolutely not. He lacks the intensity you bring. He can't match your fervor, not at all. You crave the genuine connection, right? I do. His attempts are insufferable. Your passion is what I yearn for, Frankie. This desire belongs to me. Admit it. Declare it. You capture my desire, Frankie. This exchange might feel uplifting for someone named Frankie. I'm not Frankie, the one mentioned less favorably about a personal aspect that I was merely born with. I'm convinced that either God or nature possesses a sense of humor. I truly hold that belief, despite my natural skepticism. My own narrative sometimes feels unbelievable, even though I've experienced it. I entered this world privileged, yet constrained. My origin is the result of an affair with Edward Wilcox. I remained an outsider. My birth was the result of my father, Big Eddie, and a woman never acknowledged by name. My existence was somewhat dismissed, often downplayed by the only grandfather I knew. Ideally, such revelations should come during one's teenage years, not my reality though. From early on, I was acutely aware of my exclusion from the Wilcox legacy. Yet, in a way, I was also part of it. Grandpa Archibald Wilcox, a towering figure, expanded our familial wealth and wielded significant political influence, often through discreet contributions. He appreciated the national Republican tax policies, but was often seen in the city engaging with local Democrats, humorously remarking that their support could be secured more economically. Yet, his concerns weren't solely financial. Having inherited the family enterprise, he felt responsible for the entire clan. The importance of family heritage and legacy was deeply instilled in him. Grandpa shared stories of our lineage, empowering yet with a hint of warning. He repeatedly emphasized, you're a Wilcox. Your father had his share of youthful errors. I tried my hardest to set him straight, with mixed results. If I'd been completely successful, perhaps you wouldn't be here. But here you are, undeniably a Wilcox. My interactions with him were limited, but I distinctly remember a visit where the toothpaste tube seemed nearly empty. After using it, I mentioned the need for more, but Grandpa demonstrated how to extract every last bit, insisting on the value of fully utilizing what we buy. Xander, our family's wealth doesn't justify wastefulness. It's crucial to fully appreciate and utilize what we have, he advised. At eight years old, this seemed ludicrous to me. Our wealth appeared to negate such frugality. I didn't grasp the metaphor then, but the memory stuck with me, amusingly reflecting Grandpa's paradoxical nature of being both affluent and economical. My half-brother Cyrus, ten years my senior, was more of a mentor than a rival due to our age gap. Handsome and intelligent, he protected me fiercely, especially against any hints of gossip regarding my birth. He'd challenge anyone speaking ill of me, ensuring they thought twice about their words. Our bond extended to comics, sharing and discussing his old favorites. Our tastes usually aligned, except when I preferred Miles Morales over Peter Parker as Spider-Man, sparking our only major disagreement. Jessica, whom I affectionately called Mom, was the only mother figure in my life. Due to medical issues, she had just one child, Cyrus. My father's actions led to my unexpected place in the family, with Grandpa Wilcox ensuring he fulfilled his parental duties. My mom never hinted during my childhood that I wasn't her biological child. She was a far better guardian than Big Eddie, treating me as her own while he merely tolerated my presence. Remarkably, the woman my biological father had been unfaithful to was the one who showered me with love, making me feel cherished in a way he never did. She always affectionately referred to me as her son. When the truth came to light, she reassured me, you are my son in every way that matters. Don't ever doubt that. I may not have given birth to you, but you are my child, and that will never change. Hearing this at the age of eight, the concept of biological connection was beyond me. I couldn't grasp why mom was so affectionate while Big Eddie remained distant. Later in life, I discovered that Grandpa Wilcox had once told my father, you've brought a Wilcox into the world, and that's a lifelong commitment. This saying, akin to a family creed, resonated with me, even though I was the only one among us not born within a marriage. My existence stirred family controversy, but Grandpa Archibald's determination ensured I was included. His influence was so commanding that even after his death, the family seemed to act with his approval in mind, perhaps partly due to the legal mechanisms in place to fulfill his wishes, though I suspect the fear of upsetting his memory played a role. Grandpa Wilcox bequeathed $30 million to each grandchild, and there were four of us. Two were my cousins through Big Eddie's brother, and then there was me and Cyrus. Grandpa Archie deemed me a rightful heir, with the stipulation that we'd receive our inheritance at 30, a neat alignment of age and amount. More than the inheritance, it was Grandpa's intentions that struck me. His will emphasize the importance of forging our paths without being spoiled by wealth and enjoying life with the assurance of future security. This perspective resonated with me, granting the freedom to explore life's offerings, something I sensed Grandpa himself might have missed out on. I realized I was privileged by my last name, which opened doors to opportunities I hadn't earned. Attending a prestigious prep school, I was aware of the superficial criteria of family legacy, appearance, and prospects. 
Despite having the Wilcox name, it came with its own set of complications. Our family's wealth was well known, underscored by the substantial donations like the one funding the school's library. My peers were outwardly friendly but insincere, extending party invitations more as a formality than a genuine gesture of friendship. I was always aware of the underlying motivations, knowing that my acceptance was more for their bragging rights than for actual camaraderie. The girls were the same yet distinct, in a way that's hard to explain. My presence didn't spark enthusiasm, nor was it ignored. It was as if they felt obliged to be polite, without genuine interest. In high school, girls had priorities typical of their age, which didn't align with mine. It wasn't until college that the notion of settling down seemed to enter their minds. My physique resembled my father's in height but not in build. No one would ever mistake me for a formidable figure like Big Xander. Predictably, my high school years were devoid of romantic encounters. I didn't even attend prom, unwilling to face rejection. College presented a change of scenery. Despite having the option for more prestigious institutions through family legacy, I chose a state university to avoid the spotlight and the burden of expectation, preferring anonymity. Off-campus life was where I felt more at ease. I frequented a less-known bar, valuing the authenticity of interactions over social status. Conversations there were simple, revolving around personal stories, music critiques, or baseball, but always the Cubs, never the White Sox, in line with the bar's unspoken code. My refuge was the watering hole, or simply the hole, a blend of blue-collar and hipster clientele, united by affordable drinks. My presence there wasn't about seeking attention for superficial reasons. I craved genuine connection, even if just on friendly terms. Solitude was my usual companion, stemming from my introverted nature. I mingled mostly with the regulars and bartenders, forming a semblance of camaraderie, punctuated by generous tips which contrasted with the stinginess of others. My relationship with the bartender, George, felt close to friendship, enhanced by his warm greetings, though I wondered if it was influenced by financial transactions. This routine continued until one night, reminiscent of a classic film scene, when a woman entered alone, capturing everyone's attention, mine included. Unaccompanied women were rare and often misunderstood, labeled with outdated and harsh terms. I prefer the old-fashioned ladies of the evening, a term from a bygone era, though escorts is the modern equivalent. But the whole was far from a place where such formalities mattered. That reminds me of my wife, Carla Wilcox, originally Carla Reguero. We were far from being childhood sweethearts. In fact, if we had grown up together, I doubt she would have noticed me. I was the awkward, tall, and lanky guy, often nicknamed String Bean, eventually shortened to Bean. Carla was stunning, and still is to this day. She had luscious jet black hair that cascaded in waves, catching and reflecting light with every movement. Standing at five foot six, she had a noticeable shamrock tattoo on her right shoulder that first caught my attention. It was the only one visible at that moment, given her outfit. She had another, even more intriguing tattoo that I discovered later on. I was chatting with my friend George when she entered. Even over the loud music, the shift in the crowd's noise was palpable. Everyone's attention turned as she walked in, while fat-bottomed girls by Queen played in the background. She wore a dress that accentuated her figure, drawing eyes from every direction. The room buzzed again as someone cheerfully shouted a greeting, and though the more pretentious crowd tried to seem indifferent, their interest was obvious. I stopped myself from staring too much. She was getting plenty of attention, and I figured she wouldn't be interested in someone like me. Prolonging the inevitable disappointment seemed pointless. So, when I was at the bar talking to the bartender and heard, Would you like to dance? Why do you say? I was taken aback. I turned and my gaze initially landed on the shamrock tattoo before meeting her eyes. Caught off guard, I found myself facing the most captivating woman I'd ever seen. Despite being notoriously bad at dancing, the thought of turning her down felt like a missed opportunity. I clumsily admitted, I don't like to dance, thinking I'd blown my chance. Her response was gentle, we could just sway on the dance floor. All you need to do is hold me, if you want. I did want to, more than anything. So we ended up on the dance floor, simply holding each other and swaying to the music, which had shifted to Bon Jovi's Living on a Prayer. It was an odd choice for swaying, but it worked for us. Standing there, in close contact, was incredibly comforting. I was content to just hold her and sway, savoring her scent and the warmth of her presence, careful to keep my hands respectfully placed. When a lively tune started playing, I immediately knew dancing was out of the question for me. Trying to dodge the dance floor without appearing clumsy, I blurted out, that was nice. How about we sit this one out? Maybe I can get you a drink instead. It sounded so trite, yet to my astonishment, she accepted with, I'll take a Cape Cod. Relieved to escape the dance, yet clueless about the drink, I headed to the bar, thinking George would know. I'll meet you at our table, I said, suddenly realizing I'd claimed a spot at the bar as ours. My nerves were kicking in, worried that I'd either overstepped or sounded foolish. George, familiar with the drink order, kindly offered them on the house, leaving me puzzled but grateful, recalling the last free drink was on my birthday. Carrying the drinks back, I half expected to be drinking alone, but she was there, waiting. 
handing her the drink with a nervous, here's your drink, my lady, she playfully teased, oh, you think I'm a lady, thanks for the drink, but you might be mistaken, I'm just a woman looking for something more, maybe you need to find a real lady, after finishing her drink swiftly, she hinted at a deeper connection, embarrassed and red-faced, I knew I had to act boldly or lose the moment, in a spontaneous move, I kissed her, risking the potential backlash, but needing to express my feelings. Surprisingly, she reciprocated passionately, as if she had been waiting for this. Our kiss was intense and revealing, leading her to confidently guide my hand, signaling her interest to leave. Caught up in the moment, I almost left without settling my bar tab, but George, knowing me well, didn't fuss. We promptly left for my place, the destination unspoken but mutually understood. My apartment, though plain and underwhelming, suddenly became the setting for an unexpected and memorable evening. We got in physical. It's big, she said. I should have felt proud at that moment, as I always thought such moments were significant. However, her tone wasn't flattering, it was more fearful. We fell into an awkward silence until she suggested we slow down, saying she wasn't ready for the next step. Her message hit hard, and I felt a flush of embarrassment wash over me. I was fully undressed, feeling exposed and self-conscious. It seemed she was put off by my appearance, confirming my insecurities about my looks and my body. I thought I was fortunate to have gotten even this far with her, considering how attracted I was to her initially. As I began to dress, she clarified, I didn't say the night is over. I just think we need to pace ourselves, you know. I hesitated, not fully grasping her intention, but I stopped dressing. Soon, her actions made her intentions clear as she undressed herself, suggesting we continue in a different way. Quickly, I removed my shirt, tearing it in my haste. The loss of the shirt was inconsequential to me, overshadowed by the novelty of the situation. I didn't want the moment to end. That's when I noticed another tattoo on her, a colorful design leading towards her hip. Without crossing the boundary she set, I showed my affection in a way we both found enjoyable. She responded positively, which boosted my confidence. After reaching a high point, she gently stopped me, asking for a moment to just cuddle and recover from the intensity. Cuddling with her was comforting, her body pressed against mine. But I couldn't help feeling unfulfilled as time passed. She seemed to pick up on this and offered to help me find some release. Her endearing term and emotional attunement made me feel cared for, and I eagerly accepted her offer, looking forward to feeling closer to her. That's not what happened. She applied saliva to my body and proceeded with manual stimulation. I was incredibly excited in that moment. Her touch and the act itself were electrifying, despite the repeated actions to ensure coverage. It was merely that, a manual experience, and it led to nothing more. I was tense throughout, wondering if it would escalate, but it remained as it was. My expectations weren't completely shattered, though. The climax was intense, covering my torso. Surprisingly, it was as satisfying as it could get. My fantasies and her gentle movements were more than sufficient. Was that good? Did you like it? In that moment, I truly enjoyed it. I expressed my pleasure, acknowledging how wonderful it felt. Then, curiosity overcame me, I wondered if she was aware of my family's wealth. Such a thought threatened to taint the moment. My concern was if her interest was driven by my financial status. Why me? You could have chosen anyone, I ventured, hinting at my self-doubt about my attractiveness. Her smile was radiant, and I hoped for a romantic revelation. I sought something completely different from my past, she said. After a brief kiss on the cheek, she dressed and made no plans to stay longer. She left her number, though I doubted a future contact. It seemed like a cautious approach, possibly due to her impressions or expectations. The experience felt unbalanced, like an afterthought, reinforcing my sense of disparity with her past preferences. Despite the oddity of the situation, I wished she had stayed longer. The interaction felt transactional, and the lack of a more intimate farewell left me skeptical of her intentions. Life went on, particularly at the hole, where regulars noticed my brief encounter with Carla. Their inquiries ranged from jests about my unlikely success to probing questions about intimate details. My response, hinting at unfulfilled desires, was enough to quell the curiosity and earn some sympathetic gestures, reflecting the cynical views often shared in such settings. Reflecting on it, I still can't fathom why that night unfolded as it did. She entered my life unexpectedly and vanished just as quickly. The fleeting memory of her touch lingered, the simplest pleasure of that encounter. Yet, recalling her presence, her appearance, her essence, was complex, infused with both fondness and sorrow. These memories were tinged with regret, for she disappeared not just the following day but continued to be absent, day after day, week after week, extending to months. The circumstances that led to our brief reconnection remained a mystery to me. Mama Rosa Ruggiero's apartment was modest, yet she utilized every inch of it. Despite her efforts, she couldn't eradicate the cockroaches, they seemed inexhaustible. Still, she managed to transform her modest space in an uninviting neighborhood into a cozy home. Carla was buzzing with news. Frankie wants to reunite. Why would you consider that? He's trouble, and he's been unfaithful. Yet here you are, longing for him. I believe he's changed, he really loves me. You need to think clearly. 
That man is Xander Wilcox, from one of the city's wealthiest families. They're billionaires. How do you know all this? I keep up with the gossip columns. It's good to stay informed. But mama, there's something different about him. He may not be a heartthrob, but he's not repulsive either. He seems kind enough. It's something you don't see, mama. His feature is unusual. What about it? Is it odd? Large. It's the size. It's overwhelming. I can't even contemplate it. Listen to me. I didn't work tirelessly to raise you after your father's passing. Just for you to repeat my mistakes. He's your chance for a better life. You need to find a way to cope, whether it's getting accustomed to it or whatever it takes. I don't want to work in diners forever. I return to my usual spot, perched on a stool at the hole, nursing a bottle of rolling rock. Two months and a bit had passed when, just as I might have hinted earlier, she re-entered the hole. Any uncertainty about her purpose evaporated when she spotted me. She made a beeline for me, determination in each step. Is this seat taken, or are you expecting company? I was momentarily stunned. Her question could have sparked a witty reply, but I fumbled for words and managed. It's free. She settled on the stool across from me, offering a generous view of her outfit. What's the matter? You never called me, she said, cutting straight to the chase. I didn't think you were interested, I admitted, omitting my skepticism about the number she gave. A woman expects a call after a night like ours, wouldn't you agree? I felt offensive, yet it dawned on me that she had indeed given me her real number. My thoughts toggled between defense and realization. You said you weren't the usual type. I would have reached out if you had said otherwise. I never implied such a thing. Maybe not in words, but your actions spoke volumes. I felt dismissed after our awkward encounter, though I didn't realize it then. That's not true. I was just overwhelmed, not dismissive. I wasn't sure how to react, but it wasn't about lack of interest. That was revealing. She hadn't come to end things but seemed almost regretful, perhaps even interested. I was puzzled yet hopeful, wanting to believe in a possible second chance. It's pretty and cute, yet overwhelming. Her face brightened with a smile. Yes, all of that can be true. It's just about getting used to it, that's all. I'm not very experienced with relationships. Her words suggested a mix of apology and curiosity, which left me both confused and intrigued, pondering the unexpected turn our conversation had taken. I wasn't quite prepared for the evening to unfold as it did. Given her striking appearance, it was clear she had her share of admirers. She insisted she hadn't pursued many liaisons, and I believed her. Those eyes of hers made it difficult to doubt her sincerity. I decided to take a chance. I'd really like to keep talking, maybe somewhere more private, if you're up for it. That night marked a significant personal milestone for me. I was mindful to ensure she was comfortable before we moved closer together. I could see in her expression she was preparing for each moment as we got closer. It was a delicate balance, constantly checking in to gauge if we could go further. Part of me was anxious she might change her mind, but she stayed with me. We moved together slowly, and although it was challenging to maintain a steady pace, her response encouraged me to continue. That's nice, keep doing that. Her breathing became heavier, and while it was difficult for me to keep a slow rhythm, I didn't want the moment to end prematurely. You're beautiful. Then, she expressed a deep sigh of relief. Oh, oh, oh. I sensed she might be experiencing discomfort, yet I was at a point of no return. The thought of stopping crossed my mind, but she appeared receptive. For the first time, I experienced a significant intimate connection. Afterward, she was quiet, and I cuddled her, apologizing. She seemed surprised by my apology, tightening her hold on me. Sorry, why are you sorry? I embraced her more firmly, noticing her flushed appearance. I thought you wanted me to stop, but I continued. Stop. I didn't want you to stop. It was wonderful. I wished it had lasted longer. It was comforting. She pulled me in for a passionate kiss. I really enjoyed it, truly. You were so considerate, and it was a fulfilling experience. You really mean that. You're not just saying it. Of course not. I don't pretend about something as significant as this. I might force a smile for people I dislike, but this is different. It wasn't explosive, but it was very nice, and that's genuine. She looked at me thoughtfully, was this your first time? I couldn't help but laugh, her question easing the lingering nervousness. My laughter grew, breaking the remaining tension. If she had decided to leave then, I would have understood. Instead, she watched me with an amused smile, which completely disarmed me. The evening unfolded with intimate conversations and moments of closeness. I shared my life stories with her, and we would reconnect emotionally and physically throughout the night. Lying there, with her resting against me, was a feeling I cherished deeply. As morning crept in, we fell asleep in each other's arms, my hand gently resting near her heart. Waking up next to her, feeling her quiet breath, was a serene start to the day. However, I realized I had been the one sharing all along, she hadn't opened up much in return. It took some time for me to voice my vulnerabilities. By then, we had been seeing each other for two weeks, never venturing out publicly, content with our private meetings. My naivety in relationships didn't dampen my enthusiasm for our connection, which seemed unaffected by my financial status. I talked endlessly about my family, and she listened intently. Eventually, I inquired about her life. She shared bits about her home and mother, and even suggested I meet her. 
The prospect excited me, though I wasn't ready for her to meet my family, fearing my father's potential reaction. Meeting her mother, Mama Rosa, was a warm experience. She embraced me with open arms, making me feel welcomed instantly. Her acceptance came easily, and by our second meeting, I reciprocated the warmth fully. Mama Rosa, seeing us together, playfully acknowledged our bond, hinting at a deeper connection between us. Carla soon moved in with me, and our relationship naturally progressed. I proposed to her thoughtfully, choosing a ring that represented sincerity rather than wealth. Despite the unconventional manner of my proposal, kneeling with both knees, it felt right, and her graceful acceptance made the moment perfect. I simply asked, Carla, will you marry me? She didn't hesitate, even with my clumsy proposal. Her response was immediate, yes, I'll marry you. I can't believe you took so long to ask. That night and the following morning were unforgettable. We shared a deep connection, and I felt elated, like I was on top of the world. We talked about our future together, the wedding, children, and growing old together. I felt a joy akin to what I imagined the most contented creature would feel, using playful metaphors like a pig in mud or a sultan in his glory, though I was neither. Their connection was intense and unbridled. Frankie and she were in a passionate embrace, completely absorbed in the moment. It was a level of intimacy I'd never experienced with her. Frankie seemed to understand her desires in a way that I hadn't, fulfilling her request without hesitation, as they communicated openly and fervently about their physical connection. The wedding plans caused quite a stir. My father, Big Eddie, expressed strong disapproval, pointing to her family background, which ironically wasn't too different from ours. When he really wanted to make a point, he'd call me son, a departure from the usual lad, a nickname that followed me from childhood through adulthood, reminding me of his reluctant acknowledgement of me as his offspring. My brother Cyrus, on the other hand, showed concern but in a more protective manner. He never saw us as rivals, perhaps it was the age gap or simply because he shared more of grandpa's compassionate nature than dad ever did. I really want you to be content, Xander, and I hope you understand my intentions. Your experiences with relationships are limited, and that's not meant to be a criticism. You haven't been acquainted with her for very long, and it's possible that some individuals have motives that aren't immediately clear to us. Coming from a well-off family background, you have something that she doesn't. I respected his straightforwardness. However, I wasn't concerned. I had a good understanding of Carla and was confident in my choices, although I knew he didn't see it the same way. He eventually came around and even offered to finance our wedding, which I politely declined. Paying for a simple ceremony was within my means, but I gratefully accepted his gesture to cover our honeymoon as a wedding present. The wedding was a small affair in New Orleans' Jackson Square, attended only by Cyrus and Mama Rosa. It was a personal and joyous occasion. Big Eddie and Cyrus contributed nothing financially. The simplicity and intimacy of the event made it perfect. Post-ceremony, Carla and I took a carriage ride, drawing attention in her bridal gown and my tuxedo. Spectators often engage with newlyweds in such a setting, offering playful remarks and congratulations. We embraced the moment with a kiss, much to the delight of the onlookers who toasted to our happiness. The carriage ride through the city was a cherished experience, marking our own unique celebration. Our stay was brief, just for the wedding day and night, but it set a positive tone for our journey ahead. The honeymoon spanned a month of luxury cruising, showcasing new parts of the world to Carla and myself. Beyond the romantic moments, it was the shared experiences and discoveries that enriched our journey, like her delight in new encounters, from scenic views to local wildlife. The trip exceeded our expectations in every way. During our travels, I opened up about my trust fund and family history, revealing more about myself. Carla's understanding and support made these conversations meaningful, far beyond the casual interactions with friends or acquaintances. We parasailed together in a two-seater. Her excitement mingled with fear, and she clung to me for reassurance. At times, her grip was so firm it was almost painful, but it was a comforting kind of ache. I felt privileged to be her source of security. After the adventure, she leapt into my arms, enveloping me in a tight embrace, repeatedly whispering I love you. The kiss we shared then was unforgettable, pure, and devoid of any further intentions. We even bought a photo of the moment, then celebrated the day with a meal. Post-marriage, she suggested her cousin move into my former apartment. I would have agreed to anything for her, eager to welcome any of her relatives. Meet my cousin Frankie. He looked nothing like her, with his pale skin and reddish hair contrasting sharply against Carla's dark, olive-toned beauty. Regardless of our differences, I accepted him, valuing anyone significant to Carla. However, Frankie seemed distant and unapproachable. Ignoring my father's advice to tackle problems directly, I allowed him to move in, hoping to eventually win his favor. Our daughters, Alexandria and Rosa, took after their mother, winning the genetic jackpot. Spotting any resemblance to me in them was a challenge, and I often wondered if it was mere wishful thinking. They were distinct yet undeniably her image. Carla embraced her role as a homemaker, a decision I supported, ensuring she didn't need to work. My routine was consistent, leaving at 7am and returning by 7pm, dedicating my evenings and weekends to family. 
Carla's voice echoed with intense emotion as she and Frankie were caught in a moment of betrayal, shattering the trust and harmony of our life together. Frankie tugged at her hair as he reached his climax with her. He collapsed beside her, and they both lay in silence for a moment. Frankie then moved away and rested on his back. He never satisfies you like that, does he? Never. He's always so gentle. Not really stepping up, is he? He's not. Not like you, Frankie. You're intense in a way that's unforgettable. You should just avoid him altogether. Then we wouldn't have this issue. If I do that, it's over. You know you're the one I prefer. You say that, but I'm tired of the precautions. With your history, I can't risk it. If Xander gets a hint, it's all done, and that's the truth. I had to be cautious when there was a chance of pregnancy. I had to keep him at bay, making excuses until I was sure there were no consequences from you. I've been careful, except for that one time. You always remind me, and I suffered for weeks. I told my husband it was a stubborn infection. I don't like when you call him husband. It sounds too affectionate. Just refer to him as your spouse if you must. I'd rather you call him a fool. We're in too deep for these squabbles. Now's not the time for foolishness. You're right. We need to call him something. I just can't stand his name. Wilcox, it's as if they're flaunting a joke with their name. I wish you would be more intimate with me before getting so intense. I won't compete with him in that way. Let him have that role. It's thrilling to know he's overshadowed by me. All right, Frankie, we'll leave it at that. I'll let him think he's important in that way. The thought alone will be more satisfying than his efforts. I was content, observing my two daughters blossom. With a partner I cherished and children we shared, I found a sense of belonging that eluded me in my birth family. Despite my personal limitations, which affected our partnership in certain aspects, our compatibility shone through, particularly in parenting. That fulfillment sustained me, and I hoped it would suffice for her too. Cyrus, straddling roles of a brother, mentor, and father figure, harbored doubts. His presence was a constant, especially given Big Eddie's indifference. I longed for a father's attention, for moments that weren't just about upholding family dignity but about simple, heartfelt connection. Cyrus was the elder I revered, never fully warming up to Carla, yet he respected my happiness, treating her well. This routine continued until it didn't. An unexpected, serious discussion unfolded at Cosmos, a bar Cyrus preferred. What I anticipated as a casual brotherly chat turned into a serious confrontation, or an intervention as some might call it. Cyrus affirmed his brotherly love, emphasizing it to make me heed his words. He hinted at concerns, pushing me to confront realities I preferred to avoid. Despite our bond, his suggestion to eavesdrop on Carla using hidden devices in our former apartment unnerved me. His wealth against my lack, I reluctantly agreed, insisting he stay uninvolved with the recordings. I trusted him and kept my end of the promise, as did he, in not accessing the tapes. I listened, adhering to our agreement. He was intimate with her again. It seemed like every time they met, they were quick to be close. When I came home, the connection wasn't the same. Sure, there were kisses and hugs, and the usual, welcome back honey, I've missed you. But I never felt that immediate desire from her. She might have missed me, but she didn't yearn for me, not in the way I noticed with him. Listening to their intimacy was hard enough. Their conversation afterwards was even more disturbing. I overheard Frankie speaking about my potential misfortune. What if he had an accident? We could inherit everything. What are you suggesting? An unfortunate event. That would mean we inherit it all. Carla seemed hesitant. Fifteen million is a considerable amount. It's nearly a billion. That's an exaggeration. It's nowhere near that much. Her concern seemed more about the risk of getting caught than moral objections. It's still a significant sum. More than we could ever spend. I can't imagine needing that much. Are you defending him? Do you love him? His tone was menacing. Not at all. My love is for you, that's clear. Xander's family has influence, and they wouldn't ignore this. He may not be their direct kin, but they'd see it as a slight. He's 29, and we should be cautious. Reed could backfire. Let's not focus on the money. Make me happy, and we can forget this for a while. That's the spirit, Frankie, you're making sense now. It was evident then, she was only worried about the consequences from my family, not about me at all. I wasn't shocked by what I heard. Carla was always a stretch for me. Deep down, I knew our relationship wasn't meant for the long haul. I contacted our family lawyer for a reputable divorce attorney. The good thing about lawyers is their discretion. My family would remain unaware of my next steps. I was ready to do what I'd been contemplating for a long time. The last thing I needed was Cyrus trying to comfort me and say he knew all along. He might have had a point, but that wasn't what I needed then. My focus was on the necessary actions. My life was at a crossroads, and it was time to make a decision. I chose to pursue a divorce. Until that moment, I was intent on reclaiming some of what I had lost. The process of serving her with divorce papers would take time, so I managed my excitement, anticipating the moment she would discover what I had initiated. Meanwhile, I sought to cherish our final moments together as a family and as intimate partners, unsure if such times would come again. The evening following my meeting with the divorce attorney, where I set everything in motion, I was filled with a strong, inexplicable desire. Perhaps it was the rush of emotions fueling me. 
That night, I was more passionate with Carla than ever before. She had mentioned her preference for intensity, so I abandoned our usual tender approach. If intensity was what she sought, I was ready to embrace that fully. I was more hands-on than usual, something I had always been curious about. For the first time, I explored with a boldness I hadn't shown before. Despite everything I knew, I half expected her to resist, but her reactions were far from negative. Indeed, they were primal and unrestrained, quite unlike any response I had heard from her before. Encouraged, I became more assertive, changing our usual rhythm to something more fervent and direct. I anticipated some sort of protest due to the intensity, but her vocal reactions were far from displeased. Our previous encounters always included a connection through eye contact. This time, her eyes conveyed a different kind of intensity. She was vocal, though not in coherent sentences, a stark contrast to our past experiences and what I knew of her time with Frankie. It was exhilarating and novel. After we paused, the silence was broken by her admittance of the experience's intensity. Her delayed affirmation was unlike any other compliment she had given before. I responded, acknowledging the significance of her reaction. She insisted on the exceptional nature of the encounter, expressing hope that I had felt the profound impact as well. Her feedback was a revelation to me, highlighting a new dimension of our interaction that had never been explored or articulated between us before. Reflecting on that moment, I can't help but think it was a blunder, if given another chance. Well, I wouldn't mind. No pressure, though. It was enjoyable, to be honest. I'm open to repeating it if you're inclined, but no worries if not. I'd be keen, to put it mildly. That response was unexpected, coming a bit too late, however. By the next day, she was served legal papers at our old place, in Frankie's company. They weren't in the middle of anything scandalous, which somehow seemed like a missed dramatic flourish for me. It seemed almost poetic, given the series of denials I'd faced, that even this final act lacked the theatricality I'd imagined. The divorce proceedings were tumultuous, and I'd rather not delve into those details. They're still painful. It was a whirlwind of shouting, blame, and tears. But after all was said and done, the pivotal outcome for me was gaining primary custody of our daughters, age three and five. I focused on shielding them from the upheaval, and, to her credit, so did Carla. She secured visitation rights, including one weekend a month and shared holidays. For me, having custody was paramount. I even had unsettling dreams about another man taking my place in significant future moments with my daughters. A psychologist might have insights into why such thoughts haunted me. The final goodbye was when she packed up and Francis arrived to collect her. He offered a parting kiss and managed a smile in my direction. Carla seemed torn, likely over leaving the girls behind. I couldn't resist a jab, farewell, Carla. Go be with your beloved, free from my supposedly daunting presence. I added, mockingly referring to my own physique. Carla retorted, asserting a comparison between me and Frankie that was both humorous and absurd. Frankie, eager to shift away from personal digs, threw in a startling claim about the paternity of our children. It was time to confront the truth. Carla, perhaps you'd like to explain. I remarked, curious yet apprehensive about her response. She hesitated, clearly uncomfortable, but the truth was unavoidable. She admitted to the reality, shaped by technological advances and familial pressures, including the inevitable DNA tests and a trust fund set up by his family. He responded immediately, with an incredulous look. Are you kidding me? I regretted not recording his reaction. It was a rapid journey through a spectrum of emotions. Imagining the viral potential on YouTube brought a smirk to my face, a small victory in enriching the family legacy. I savored a moment of triumph, although it lacked financial gain. You see, Francis, I've been the one raising my kids. His expression was unforgettable, almost making the ordeal worthwhile. Almost, Frankie Donovan remarked, she'll still receive alimony from your well-paying job. That sent me into a fit of laughter. What job? I've been unemployed since our marriage. Frankie's face turned red with frustration. Don't give me that. You leave for work every day. I act as if I go to work. I'm home every evening. Think about it, ever heard of someone with my supposed salary not working late? My income is just a stipend from Cyrus, expecting repayment. I've not worked a day, even though I have an office. Carla looked bewildered. Then what have you been doing all this time, dear? At Carla's term of endearment, Francis shot her a glance. She quickly apologized, sorry, just a habit. Grinning, I addressed Carla, eager to reveal the truth I had sensed and confirmed. I'll tell you, dear. I was stirring the pot. I've been busy with dance classes, exercise, martial arts, and studying. I've had a full schedule. Carla's look changed, perhaps to one of respect, or at least the beginning of it. Frankie, preoccupied with the loss of potential wealth, tried to salvage his pride. You've been made a fool of. I've had my way for years. I burst into laughter, finding humor in the situation. Carla appeared remorseful, while Frankie seemed bewildered. Really? Remember, Carla was with me long before you came along. I doubt your claims hold up. You thought my children were yours, and your efforts were in vain. So, who's the fool? That's what I'd like to know. Francis was seething with anger at that moment, visibly shaking. His hands twitched, signaling his urge to react, either with words or actions. 
I stood there, feeling smug, ready for whatever he might do. Deep down, I was almost hoping he would lash out physically. I wanted to see him embarrassed in front of his beloved. I had already achieved what I wanted from the situation. I had outsmarted them. I might have lost the trophy, but then again, she was never really mine. I secretly wished to conclude this saga with him being humiliated both mentally and physically. One shouldn't mess with a Wilcox, even an illegitimate one. Carla stepped in while Francis was consumed by his fury. She looked at me quizzically. If you knew I had feelings for Frankie, why did you let things go on till the bitter end? Her expression was hard to read. I replied with a metaphor. A wise man once said, squeeze everything you can out of the toothpaste tube. Frankie exclaimed, I always say, the rich are mad. The world would be better off without their influence. He was working himself into a frenzy, and I sensed things might turn physical. I was almost looking forward to it, reminiscent of sneaking tastes of cake frosting as a child. Carla gently touched his arm, trying to calm him. Frankie, let's just leave with the children. Her soothing words seemed to infuriate him further. His face flushed a deep shade, accentuated by his usual pallor. His children. I won't be responsible for someone else's kids. Carla continued her attempts to pacify him. They're my children too, named as we had discussed. He grabbed her hand tightly, pulling her along despite her reluctance. We are not taking care of kids that aren't mine. Get into the car, he demanded. As she left, Carla gave me a look that seemed to convey regret, maybe an apology, or perhaps worry for our children. It was ambiguous. She departed with him, leaving me with mixed feelings. I was content that my plan had worked, yet saddened. Her glance stirred doubts about whether I had made the right decision. I had always hoped there was some genuine affection for me in her. Her expression suggested it might be true, though I had been misled by her before. Our divorce was swift and unopposed, both relieving and unexpected for me, and we never met during the proceedings. Our lawyers managed everything, mine was top-notch, while hers was less so. My lawyer proposed the terms, and hers accepted without contest. It wasn't shocking, given I had no assets for her to claim, but it was still painful. I had hoped she would show some interest in our children's lives. I offered generous visitation rights, but she never asked for more. It seemed she was eager to leave our past behind and start anew with her chosen partner, which left me feeling she was content to move on without me and our kids. It had been three months since the divorce when she contacted me. Surprisingly, she initiated the conversation. She left voicemails, urging me to call back and talk. Initially, I disregarded her attempts, focusing on moving forward. However, I always took calls from Mama Regiro, a woman I deeply respected and who treated me like family, despite everything. Mama Regiro insisted I speak with Carla, her daughter. She described Carla as troubled and in need of a conversation. Despite my reluctance and discomfort at the thought of seeing Carla, Mama Regiro's words, calling me the son she never had, struck a chord with me. I agreed to meet, choosing a public place for the meeting to ensure a safe environment. Carla appeared as she always did, dressed in her usual fashion that once caught my eye. The sight of her stirred old feelings, despite the time that had passed. The meeting was straightforward. Carla expressed her love, acknowledging the past difficulties, but emphasizing her desire to be with me. I was taken aback, having anticipated a different agenda from her, perhaps financial or critical. Instead, she declared her love and regret for leaving, proposing a reconciliation. Her words, unexpectedly, warmed my heart. The sincerity in her expression made me overlook past grievances. Overwhelmed by emotions, I found myself considering a future with her again. We'll sign a prenuptial agreement. My family insisted on it initially, but now, I see the importance of it myself. In case of a divorce, you'll receive $5 million. Why should I receive that amount? That's a fraction of your trust fund. That's not accurate. Don't joke around. I thought I was entitled to half, which would be $15 million each for us. So, $5 million is a significant portion of your $15 million. I hesitated to correct her understanding, particularly since my initial inheritance of $30 million had substantially increased. But I don't want that. You don't think a significant portion of my wealth is fair? No, I certainly do not. It crossed my mind that some people's true nature never changes. I've been mistaken before and this was no exception, but the shock came with her next words. I shouldn't receive anything. At all. Why would you say that? Without you, I have nothing. If you were to leave me again, I'd lose what matters most. I've made grave errors and cannot reverse them, but I'm committed to making amends. I don't want you to doubt my intentions during every argument, thinking I'm after your wealth. Her admission caught me off guard. What do you mean by what matters most? You. I'm talking about you. Despite my happiness, I harbored doubts that needed clearing. We needed more than physical intimacy to rebuild our trust. Instead of rushing things, I chose to rekindle our connection slowly. I took her out to a dance club, a place with no prior associations for us, possibly a fresh start. It turned out to be the watering hole, where our story started. I spent a dollar to play some songs and invited her to dance. Her surprise turned to acceptance, her expression mixed with confusion and curiosity. Certainly, I can rephrase that while maintaining the same tone and removing any explicit content. 
If I may say so, we really dazzled on the dance floor, drawing quite the crowd and lively cheers. Carla's charm was undeniable and played a significant role in the attention we received. When we planned this outing, she dressed as she typically would, making quite an impression. It was flattering to hear the enthusiastic compliments from the onlookers. After the music ended, we took a seat, both of us catching our breath from the lively session. Her eyes sparkled with excitement as she praised our dance skills. Those dance lessons really paid off. You were amazing out there. When we first met, you claimed two left feet, but tonight, you moved with such natural grace. I admitted to her, I used to say I disliked dancing because I never knew how. But I've always wanted to learn, and now I've got the hang of it. She laughed at herself, I was so clueless back then. The conversation took a serious turn when I ventured to ask about her past relationship with Frankie, feeling safe to bring it up now that he was out of the picture. She opened up about leaving him, describing a hasty departure back to her mother's home, acknowledging the tough reception she received there. Curious, I inquired further, why did you leave him? She revealed that Frankie had proposed unethical ways to make money, which conflicted with her values. This led to her decisive break from him. I understood Frankie's fate was sealed, given his dubious plans. In our city, his schemes meant trouble. I felt compelled to discuss with Carla the choices she made, seeking to understand her perspective. Our conversation touched on difficult truths about relationships and choices, leading to moments of shared laughter despite the harsh realities. It was an odd comfort, finding humor in the honesty of our flawed actions. It's the rarity of such honesty, especially when it's tinged with self-reflection, that strikes a chord. Surrounded by deception in many aspects of life, I found this moment of candidness both amusing and admirable. I really shouldn't be asking, but I need your assistance. I'm at a loss on where else to turn. What exactly do you need help with? It's hard to explain. I want to be close to our children, and I also need financial support to secure a place to live. I'm not directly asking you for money, but perhaps you could assist me in finding employment, given I lack work experience. Would you be open to that? I'm puzzled by your request. After all, you seemed satisfied with your previous situation. I can't fathom why you'd walk away from it. The situation deteriorated. My feelings changed, especially after our last encounter. It made me see things differently, and I couldn't feel the same way about him anymore. I had to think of you to feel anything. That was an unexpected revelation. I might have a solution. I need someone to care for our children. I could compensate you for that. Would there be enough for me to afford a place? There's no need for that. You can stay in our house. Wait, our house. But isn't it yours now? It's always been our home, even when you left. She fell silent, her tears speaking volumes. After a moment, she tried to speak, hesitated, then finally found her words, her face now dry. I've come to realize that I love you. No, that's not quite it. I understand now that I love you more than before. I cared for Frankie, but my feelings for you were stronger. I don't expect you to believe me, but it's the truth. It was difficult to respond. You once said you were happy with him, then with me. What does love mean in all this? The truth is, I never really felt that deep love with you. Frankie had it. It confirmed what I had always sensed, yet it was painful to hear. I understand. But know that you've always had my love, even when I knew I wasn't the one you cherished most. She must have caught a glimpse of my expression or detected the sorrow in my tone. I didn't phrase that well. You weren't like that before, but things have changed. I didn't mean never, just that it was the case before, not anymore. I know I'm not being clear. I love you, and I think I always have, in some way. Just not right from the start. Maybe I should stop talking now. I was annoyed by her rambling until she mentioned now. That word gave me a flicker of hope, yet I remained skeptical. Why now? I was on edge, waiting for her reply. Her next words would shape my reaction. Unless she mentioned love, I was prepared to walk away. I braced myself to hear that I was merely a financial support, a good father, or just someone who provided her with security and affection. While all those roles fit, I couldn't settle for being someone's choice without genuine love for me. She paused, a brief moment that seemed to stretch forever. I realized I loved you. I really do. You're just wonderful in every way. The stress melted away, replaced by sheer happiness. Her choice of words was unexpectedly apt. Like Mary Poppins, you mean. She looked puzzled. I don't follow. I'm certainly not implying anything else. Her words were unexpectedly fitting, though not in the way I had imagined. It shouldn't have worked out, but miraculously, it did. My comment. I don't see how he could ever trust her, or even want to be with her after the recordings and the cheating. With his newfound confidence and abilities he should play the field and find real love, and not an infatuation. 